Good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on the time zone you're joining from us from today. This is Allison Narvison, Director of Marketing at Core BTS, and welcome to today's webinar on ransomware. We would like to make this session as interactive as possible, so throughout our presentation, we encourage you to interact with us by typing questions and comments into the Q&A pane. We will be answering questions live during the event, and we will leave time at the end as well. Today on our panel, we have Rick Rothenberger, Core Regional Director of Cloud and Managed Services, Steve Soto, Alert Logic Territory Manager of Southeast U.S., and Stephen Cody, Alert Logic Chief Security Evangelist. I will now pass it along to Rick Rothenberger, Core Regional Director of Cloud Managed Services, to introduce Core and our guests from Alert Logic today. Hi, everybody. Appreciate you being here today with us. Uh, it's a pleasure being uh, to be here with Core BTS friends customers and colleagues. Um, I wanted to take a second and point out core BTS's areas of focus um, and then introduce Steve Soto. Core BTS is a 25-year IT consulting company. We've got 15 offices and 300 employees and we specialize in the areas of security, number one, uh, cloud and managed services, staffing. We also have a long history uh, with being a systems integrator and value added reseller. And we have a collaboration practice. Both the systems inter integrator and VAR and collaboration uh, pieces of the business are centered around top manufacturers like Cisco, Microsoft, Citrix, EMC, to name a few. Um, in, in regard to security, a lot of focus around security these days, as everybody knows, our security practice, our, our core BTS employees are performing right now services, for example, security audits, vulnerability assessments, pen testing. We also have a lot of growth around security as a service. In particular, core offers a managed on the network layer, a managed intrusion detection service. On the systems layer, a log management service. And on the application side, a managed web application firewall. All of this is tied into a 24 seven security operations center in which all employees are GIAC certified. So, um, with that, I'd like to introduce Steve Soto. Uh, Steve's a 20-year veteran of the information technology industry. He has spent that time helping companies of all sizes evaluate the benefits and advantages of IT solutions delivered as a service. Specific areas of focus include procurement and information security compliance solutions, Steve possessed a significant experience helping organizations understand the value of flexibly deployed solutions in areas experiencing marketplace and regulatory evolution. Based in Atlanta, he's the Southeast Territory Manager for Alert Logic, an information security and compliance solutions provider based out of Houston, Texas since 2013. So take it away, Steve. Steve, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. I've been jam jammering on here without you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks very much for the warm introduction, and thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate all of you joining us today. I think we've got a great day planned for you. I'm really just here to give you a, a brief overview of our company and turn over the, uh, portion, the large portion of the conversation to Stephen Cody and to talk about um, a very uh, timely topic in uh, ransomware uh, attacks that are occurring across the country today. We're hearing from customers daily, and I think it's a testament to all of you who've joined us today that this is a serious problem that's uh, impacting uh, great fortunes of the uh, U.S. economy. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our company just briefly so you can gain a sense of uh, you know who we are, how Core and, and Alert Logic work together to address some of the challenges Stephen's going to point out to us. Um, 
it's you know it's 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 uh scary stuff and uh it's nice to have some options and friends like alert logic and core bts and uh such so we aim to do today we um are a uh, as as rick mentioned we are a security and compliance solution provider we're based in houston texas we've been around uh since 2002 so nearly 15 years and really the mission here is to um help our customers uh, achieve the security and compliance outcomes that they're seeking. Uh, we talk about outcomes because we are um, more than just a product company, and I'll, I'll give you a little detail around that. Um, but first, sort of the problem, if you will. Um, breaches are happening every day. Uh, we see them in the news. You see them in the news. You see them in your environments, hopefully not, but uh, in, in environments similar to yours that, that give you pause. Um, we see all these brand names here on the on the screen today, and some of these are have been you know a few years back. There's been there's not a, a week that passes that we don't see uh, some uh, news of an attack in some environment, um, and the impacts are great to the business. There's certainly the financial loss, but there's also significant brand and, and uh, reputational risk, um, and then uh, not the least of which being if you're in a compliance driven organization or you maybe your customers have compliance regu uh, requirements, um, the, the, the scrutiny from regulators is going uh, is there and is going to only continue. Um, we talk about uh, these attacks. Um, they're really quite sophisticated, um, commonly referred to uh, as the cyber kill chain, uh, are the steps that the most successful attacks and attackers follow. Um, in order to um, infiltrate your environments. So those are the kinds of things that we know the tactics they're using, and so we are trying to develop the countermeasures collectively to address and, um, and disrupt. Um, companies like yourselves uh, are challenged to defend against these. It's an ever-evolving problem. Um, we de typically leverage tools to do so, but those can be difficult to use, um, expensive to maintain, to purchase, um, to gain value from. Um, it certainly takes people as part of that process, and that's a tough, tough um, uh, environment today to hire quality security staff. I work most often with the core BTS office in Nashville, and the security industry for employment in the Nashville market, among many others in the country, probably where you are as well, is a near zero unemployment environment. So great for everybody that there's uh, plenty of jobs out there. The problem is there just aren't enough qualified folks uh, to, to, uh, to fill all the openings there are, and um, it's hard to keep them if you can find them. And it gets more expensive, obviously, as a result. And then lastly, um, or additionally to the challenge, um, the attackers are not sitting still. They are constantly evolving their tactics. They're very professional organization. Stephen will detail that for us. Um, so it takes a lot of, you can't, you're not, you don't set and forget it. It's a constant of evolution. Um, so uh, Alert Logic thinks about these problems, Core thinks about these problems, and, and how we can try to help our customers. Um, and, and, and so that's uh, how we come to market. Uh, and I talked about it a little bit earlier. We're really built to deliver security and compliance outcomes you're seeking and trying to help you overcome, A, the challenges on the previous slide, and B, most importantly, the, the methods and, and techniques of the attackers that are after your data and your customers' data. Um, broadly, uh, we deliver the technology, the uh, analytics, and the people necessary to help um, you uh, stay ahead of the attackers and protect your environments. Uh, we do that through deep security insights. Um, we're looking across the infrastructure stack. Uh, we're looking at pre- and post-compromise detection and analysis, and looking globally at threat visibility and intelligence. Uh, we're continuously monitoring and protecting your environment. This is 24 by 7 services um, and prompt response times. Um, and we try to do this uh, alert logic as a uh, security as a service solution. So everything we do is monthly fee for service, subscription model, not a lot of uh, CapEx up front, um, and really pay for results uh, from your angle. Uh, I don't want to dive too deeply here, but in essence, what we're trying to do here is collect data from wherever you have IT uh, across the infrastructure stack. So we can cover physical deployments all the way out to public cloud environments 
and we're responsible for all facets of this um, uh, this this workflow, including and most importantly, uh, identifying real threats in your environment and providing you not only the, the alerting and the warning of these threats, but um, remediation and um, um, removal uh, recommendations as part of our overall um, relationship and conversation with you. Uh, that's we think we do a pretty good job of that, and and so and with Core we think we can deliver great service to you all, uh, in the, in and help in this world. Um, uh, some third parties uh, have weighed in as well, uh, but um, you know that's kind of how we're we uh, aim to help you um, and help you address some of the things Stephen's going to talk about. And um, what I'd like to do now is in, introduce you to uh, Stephen Cody. He's the Chief Security Evangelist for Alert Logic, and he's going to talk about our main topic today, um, the, the, the very real and current threat of uh, ransomware. Thank you. Stephen? Thanks, Steve. Appreciate that. It gets a little uh, confusing with the Steve's and Stevens around here. <laughs> so um, let's get into ransomware. Um, one of the first things we want to talk about, what is ransomware, right? You know, it's been a very hot topic over the last year or so. But it's actually been around a lot longer. You know, malicious software that restricts access to an infected system or data and the attacker demands some sort of payment, right? It doesn't say whether it was encryption or locked or just locked you out of your PC by changing a password, if uh, some of you guys might remember that. Uh, characteristics, you know, compromised file encryption, that's today's characteristics, you know, looking for payment, usually across Bitcoin. Um, you know, the complications around that is it always is for breach. Well. Yes, it is because, you know, there, there was a penetration. Somebody did a phishing email. Somebody went through the process of clicking on that phishing email, then encrypting a workstation, spreading across, across those network shares, finding out what that workstation had access to, then encrypting those portions of access and so on and so forth as it goes up the chain. So it, it definitely is, you know, and if even if you're paid, you know, are your files restored untampered? Usually yes. but do they make a copy of it in the process since they have the rights to? Probably so. So you can definitely think that something got out there. And is there a chance that they would uh, do it again? And the answer would be yes. You know, you never know. Um, I haven't heard of actually too many stories of guys coming back for second tastes because usually after they make that one payday, they move on. But um, it is absolutely possible for somebody to do that. As we look through the timeline, as I said, ransomware isn't something new. We've been dealing with this since, you know, the, you know, the early 90s, uh, as I remember. So, you know, it's, it started off as just file locking. You know, this it, actually started off even easier than that was just, um, if anybody remembers old Windows commands, you know, changing the config.sys, the autoexec.bat, to not let your machine boot up until you paid some type of coin or money. We used to do it around the office just to mess with each other. But, you know, then it went to changing people's passwords and locking them out of passwords. Then it went to, you know, changing the uh, permissions on files, you know, read, write, yeah, read, read, write, read, write, execute. Um, and, you know, you would lock out permissions until, you know, you got what you wanted. Um, then they start doing the scareware thing where they got into sending you, hey, you've been infected with this variant where, yeah, you just got infected with scareware, um, you know, pay us $29 and we'll make sure we clean this malware off your workstation. Uh, we saw lots of that, you know, all the way up into the, through the 2000s. Then we started getting more into SMS and then we started seeing the first variants of like things like CryptoLocker back in 2013. Then we started seeing many variants of crypto. Crypt X, XX, you know, which is the crypto locker, uh, crypto free. The, I mean, there's so many different variants out there. It's hard to go through all of them, but you see that there's just a transition and that it's the same tactics and attack vectors are being used. It's just more sophisticated malware that's now being utilized. So digging into this, we look at some of the different variants, you know, like crypto wall. You know, there's more than five variants of it. Uses AES. You know, it um, uses help files as part of the um, infection mechanism, and it has a very, very good infrastructure. These guys built out the infrastructure for this tool uh, phenomenally. In fact, they even put this out to rent as a as a service. But um, they built a solid command and control infrastructure that 
um, is very efficient at staying behind proxies, not being found, uh, hard to trace back. I mean, these guys are really good at what they do. Um, most infection methods, you know, as their, you know, the initial attack vector and download are sometimes unknown. We know that most attacks come through phishing emails with attachments, and it could be a Word doc, a PDF, Excel spreadsheet, um, you know, very many things. But then they get a remote desktop control. Then that's when they start, you know, doing RES and start accessing the system. And that's when, you know, we're starting to see a little change here where it's not just only crypto locker that's being on there. But sometimes after you de get your, you pay your fine and get decrypted, they may leave a backdoor Trojan or like a remote access Trojan on the workstation just so that the, they can keep collecting intel if they find that it's a company that it, it's worth um, uh, pursuing these days. Um, and the ransom, you know, we're talking about one and a half Bitcoin, so we're talking about you know, a little over $1,000, right? Um, now, this really started more with the residential markets, right? We, we heard a lot about that, where people were paying $200, $500 um, to get their files released. But they had such success in the uh, residential market that they started going after commercial businesses. And now that's where they're starting to see the big paydays start coming down. So we're going to start seeing more and more advanced variants that come out, like Loki and Samus, um, that will they come through the spam emails or Sometimes they even have them dropping in. Um, I just read about this the other day where they have a, um, they're starting to do like iframe injections on news magazines and newspapers that you might visit online where that's that blank space that you see in between the articles. And as you go across it, you may see your mouse quickly move from a pointer to a finger to a pointer uh, within a blink of an eye, just as you're moving your mouse across. And most people would never notice that. But in that time frame, you could, could have possibly got infected with this thing. Um, and then we have Samus, which we're starting to see hitting, you know, a lot of the web server world, the web applications, things like that, that is spreads to web servers and starts going through and propagating across all the, like, uh, redundant service, uh, server infrastructure that you might have within the backend databases. So it's a very interesting variant. But it does use stolen credentials, so this does go at a start of profiling the company that you're targeting and really understanding who works there, uh, what are the, you know, what's their favorite animals, you know, you go through their social media platforms, different things. So you definitely do uh, a profile of the companies you do that. Now, the guys didn't have to do it for residential, it didn't matter, but for companies, they got to be a little bit more uh, savvy. They have to be delivering in the right format from the right people. It has to look a certain way, have the company logo, the, the title and, you know, phone number at the bottom of the email that looks all legit, and people can look that person up and see that, oh, that's a legit person that works there. So they're they're getting very, very um, sophisticated in the way that they're delivering these payloads in the different environments. But some of the interesting things that um, it comes with is, you know, they have customer service, which that's amazing, right? And, you know, you get infected with something, they hit you with this, and they say, oh, call our hotline for um, any type of assistance or just pay this dollar amount and your files will be magically unencrypted and be available to you within uh, two hours or whatever the time frame they dictate. So it's a very interesting business, criminal underground business that these guys have created. And they're starting to make it really easy for people. So they have the countdown right there. As you can see, they even give you the links for payment. Um, it's 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 a business, right? These guys are running this just as they would any other business. So let's talk about some of the case studies that are out there. Now, everybody's heard of the Hollywood Presbyterian uh, Medical Center, uh, which was, in my opinion, one of the more interesting ones, just because uh, it really gave us an insight into the attacker profile based on how the attackers responded to the negotiations um, for payment. So the attack started as a spam email, right? The employee clicked on it, downloaded the malware, attacker gained access to that one workstation encrypts that one workstation, but then, as I said, it goes out through all the network shares and starting to access servers and starting to encrypt all those. So it, it takes time for it to get its initial foothold within within your environment, and that's usually a good time to catch it right there. But, um, you know, the guys encrypted all their data, and as you heard in the news, you know, they had to move patients. They didn't have access to patient records. They had to start going back to old manual processes. Um, and the demand, uh, what ended up being paid was uh, about $17,000. So um, 
which is pretty good. You know, it's crazy because they, I mean, they were starting to ask for billions now. $17,000, I, I haven't checked my, uh, you know, currency converter, but I don't know how many millions of rubles that might be. Maybe that's the $4 million they were talking about. But, um, you know, $17,000 was not much. So that gives you the idea that, hey, these guys are just after money. I mean, they may ask you for 50000 100000 even a million, but when it comes down to it, they're going to take what they can get. I mean, that's what this showed me right here with this actual attack. So, yeah, as we saw in our review, you know, operation disruption, you know, uh, the manual processes, the medical devices. I, I didn't even think about that. The medical devices being offline because a lot of those run through Wi-Fi networks and have to touch those databases. So that's – it was a very interesting case with that, and I think a lot of um, – not only medical centers, but I think a lot of different industries can take note on what mistakes are made along the way and how we can get better at detecting this and more efficient. Now, this one is Tweaksbury. It's a small town about 30 minutes north of Boston. Um, small target, right, um, you know, that you think that these guys wouldn't pay attention to. But, no, they didn't. They sent a, a, a note there that said um, it was a UPS package uh, delivery note, and um, they received the ransom note saying that their files were encrypted. It was going to cost them about $500 to do it. Um, and they told them, hey, don't waste your time looking for a solution because there's none that exists. Just pay us, and we'll give you your stuff back. Um, they went five days without no IT function. Um, you know, the public and private security experts under were unable to trip, decrypt the data, and there was no technical mitigation. And I hear this story over and over again. There is a, there is a, a person I met while I was doing a talk down back east, and this person came to me and said, hey, you know, I own a small media company and, you know, I, I, I got hit with ransomware a few months ago and, you know, I've been trying to reach out to the guys who encrypt my data because I want to get my data back and they're not there. I said, well, did you have a backup? And she said, well, when I found out my laptop was encrypted and I got that note, I actually plugged my, lap, my, lap, my hard drive into my laptop to do a restore, not realizing that now, as soon as she plugged that into that USB port, it then encrypted her backup drive. So now she has access to nothing. And she didn't talk to the guys for three months. And so when she reached out three months later, you know, they're gone, right, because they're automatically assuming you're working with law enforcement. So they've already moved on to their next targets. So she, there was nothing she could do. She basically, the last eight years of her business, she is starting all over again. She doesn't have access to her contacts. Uh, nothing of her profiles, her, her interviewees, her clients, all that is gone. And so you can see how this can affect a small person, uh, a small business and medium-sized business and just average Joe, right? Now we move on to, um, you know, how these guys are actually starting to um, make this easier for people. So say, you know, Joe Blow, uh, just say, for example, I went and decided I wanted to run with this. And I can go ahead and download this Ransom32, which is Crimeware as a service. So these guys have built a whole back-end infrastructure of how you deliver the payloads in the organizations, how, what are the addresses or Bitcoin accounts that, you know, they funnel the money through to get to a final account. And that's all you have to do is pay these guys a monthly fee, give them your Bitcoin account address, and you're in business. They'll actually start doing all the work for you and sending the phishing emails, and you just sit back and collect some coins, and you're sharing money with them, um, which is interesting because from the from the creator standpoint, you know, they're throwing off some of the liability on other people so that they can kind of disappear more into the background, which is actually a very smart move on their point. But this tool makes it, easily easy for the average Joe just to go ahead and start jumping into some cyber criminal business right off the bat. I mean, some 16 year old down the street could be doing it. So that's what these guys are doing. They're making it easier and easier for people to pick up these tools and get going. So we look at, you know, kind of what the, the kill chain is, kind of what uh, uh, Steve was describing earlier, but we're going to put this around ransomware. So step one is, you know, user receives a spam message, you know, with some type of an attachment. Attachment is downloaded, the malware URL beacons out to an outside server, 
and then it comes back and makes a connection and then delivers you that message uh, that is now officially on your computer. And it opens up your browser and tells you now you need to go pay. And why this rents the message is displayed on there, it starts beaconing and moving around to different environments after it's done all the file attachments and starts trying to find out what access do you have, what servers do you have access to, what USB drives are plugged in, what else can I encrypt to make this more valuable to you. Um, now, as this is the kind of a representation of the cyber kill chain, as we get to that third step where the computer screen is at, that's where we need to catch it. You know, at that initial infection where it gets downloaded uh, onto the computer and it beacons out to the outside command and control servers, and then it starts doing the downloaders, start pulling down additional payloads of malware that it needs. That's the point of detection, because if you can detect it at that point, then you just might lose a workstation, but you might, you won't lose your old network. And we have case studies that we've done with people around this where um, um, we've been able to catch it at that initial workstation before it starts beaconing out to the network shares and be able to get that administrator to pull that port and, or disable that network port before that, um, that malicious code can start beaking out and looking for additional um, devices that it can go ahead and infect. So that's where we want to stop it before it gets out. So we'll get more into that as we move on. So as we see, a lot of this software is increasing sophistication every, day, every year. Um, we saw as it went through the 90s and started just as, you know, simple, you know, auto exec op ed ed edits, and then we start changing passwords, and then we start changing permission rights on files. And then it came into encryption and kind of um, developed its own um, form and moved on as it kind of just grew and expanded. So we see that the sophistication is increasing ever more. And of course, we keep writing decryption tools, right? So um, uh, there's like, uh, for a crypto locker, right? There's several tools out there that you can use to decrypt your drive if it's an older variant. Because what keeps happening, like, do, like there was a, just a brand new release uh, just last week, because there was a decryptor made for the um, um, for the crypto locker variants. Uh, I think it was 2.0, and so they just came out with the 3.0 now because that will bypass that decrypting tool. So it's a simple cat and mouse game, chess game between security researchers and the malicious actors out there where we keep going back and forth. But um, we just got to keep ahead of this because there are some things that they are adding into this which is going to make it very hard for um, um, any type of uh, forensic investigation. One of the things is there's a new variant that I, I hear, I'm hearing rumors about on the underground market where not only does it encrypt your data and give you a limited time frame to make a payment, but if you don't make the payment, it actually, this new variant will actually affect the con, uh, the controller cards, which uh, control the hard drives within the servers, and they will actually basically um, corrupt them to the point where they lose all configuration, So, which means that that whole server becomes uh, unfunctional without brand new controller cards, which means you just lost all your data and there's no way to forensically an analyze it. So. That's a new variant that I'm hearing rumors about, but I haven't had any verification on. But um, as soon as I know, you'll know. So how do we mitigate these risks? You know, we go through, you know, we don't want to be, we want to learn from other people's lessons, right? And we don't, we definitely don't want to hit by this twice because I have seen organizations that have been hit more than once with different variants from different people, not even the same group. So. It, you know, we got to learn lessons from what we see from other people and take those to heart and make sure we make the right security best practices to be able to defend and mitigate the risk of um, ransomware. What is a great backup strategy, right? Security awareness, log management strategy, data, data classification, patch management, can't stress on that how important that is. And of course, staying informed of latest vulnerabilities. So we'll go into each one and just kind of do kind of what I did as a strategy, right? So, you know, for incremental backups, that's a very good question, right? Because most people do incremental backups throughout the week, which in, for incremental backups are basically whatever files were changed throughout the week, I will go ahead and back up. But 
do one master backup on like a, uh, a Friday night and a Saturday night when people aren't there, right? And then throughout the week to make that load easy on your network, a lot of people just do incrementals. So it, it's almost at the point right now that you got to start looking at that full backup. And you have to start looking at offline storage, um, you know, optimizing backup types and frequencies, points of restoration, because you can't restore right onto an infected server. So you have to wipe all those boxes clean, or you have to have a separate infrastructure to be able to stand up and have almost as a hot, uh, warm standby ready to go at any time that has basically a replica of production data. Um, and it comes down to sound IP fundamentals that you follow here. Security awareness programs. You know, we're seeing a lot of these are coming through phishing emails, right? You know, we really need to um, do a better job of communicating our policies. And, you know, I know, and I've been in the position of having to give these cybersecurity awareness programs and the talks and organize them. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting that humans will always be our number one um, vulnerability within our environment. And that's just the way it sits today because they're the ones that are going to click on the emails. They're the ones that do the social media, allow people to come in and be able to get passwords because people use the same passwords across multiple platforms. And so there are things that we just need to make people aware of, the simple stuff. I mean, there's things we could do with technology, like with email filters, right? Put them out there and have them start filtering our email. But not only scanning the URLs, but scan the actual attachments to make sure that there's no uh, malicious code embedded in there. Um, but it comes down to people looking at it and going, hey, I don't know this person, or I don't, I'm not familiar with this company. I'm not going to click on this. So it, it, it's basically, uh, uh, you know, changing the way people behave. And right now, most people just do this once a year, right? Security Awareness Month, do it once a year. It's a big deal for the month. And then boom, everybody kind of forgets about it. Um, some of the new programs out there are like sending you the posters you can put over the water cooler, just as funny reminders to people about, you know, don't check on this email or don't click on this link if you don't know who it is or, you know, don't go to websites that you don't know about or you don't have, you know, any prior knowledge of. You know, they're trying to teach you best practices on how to move forward on that. So um, maybe we need to step that up, you know, instead of doing it once a year, maybe we do it quarterly. Um, I know everybody hates taking that test every year and having to watch the videos, but it's important. It's not just for compliance, but it's important for you to take some lessons away. That's why sometimes bringing somebody in from the outside to explain people and show them how easy it is to hack into places or talking with your security providers and seeing that, hey, can, you, can, you, can a guy come in and just talk to my team and explain to them, hey, what are the dangers that we're, uh, an, a company like me would be facing today and how are they trying to get into us and, you know, basically scare the pants off of people so that they're like, oh, wow, I'm not going to click on any more emails here or at home, which is exactly what you want, right? So we also have to have a solid log management strategy. So it's going to take logs to be able to catch these guys coming in and out. You know, you're going to have that have to have that security in depth strategy, which is protection from everywhere from your network to your servers, to your, your you know your end workstations, your applications. Um, you build security within all the different layers, and but you need to be able to get reporting. It's great that you built security infrastructure, but if you're not getting the proper logging and reporting, and you're not getting that data and you're not correlating that data, then that infrastructure is just infrastructure. You need to be bringing that in, running it through a log product, putting it through a, a, a correlation engine that's going to look for those indicators of compromise across your network, across your hosts, across your servers, your apps, and tie that together to find an incident as quickly as possible. And you've got to log. Sometimes you can't go with just the default logging. For example, you know, if somebody's trying to brute force your, uh, your Windows box, right, um, and you know, you see a log, you know, we all know if you have three or more failed logins, usually you get a log event that gets generated, say, hey, this user has just failed three times logging in. Well, usually you're like, ah, oh, I probably forgot his password. So you see him do it another three times, you know, maybe he changed it and tried it again. Um, and then he disappears. And then you look at it, go, oh, wow, great, that's fantastic. He got his password and got in. But what if that was a malicious actor that was doing that? And finally, he did get in, and then he started trying to brute force other other environments. You never catch that piece. 
and that's not turned on by default. So making sure you not only that you're logging the data, but that you're logging the proper data to be able to find malicious activity quickly within your environment. And then finally, data classification. You know, data classification is something that, it, it's a challenge, believe me, I, I've been there. And it, most organizations just don't do it because of just the sheer challenge of, you know, finding documents not only across your server infrastructure, but what do people have loaded on their local hard drives or network shares or external drives and, you know, how do you classify that? It's just, it, it's a huge ordeal and, but I'm, I'm a big believer of keep it simple, right? Keep the finance data with the finance team. You know, keep the operational data with the operations team. And create APIs where people can talk and be able to share data, but they don't necessarily have to have access to the actual raw data. So, I mean, just separating out by department is a great start to moving down that path of data classification. Because then once you know what's in each department, then you let that department decide what are the critical assets. You know, from what do they not care about that anybody in the company could look at to what are his confidential payroll data that, you know, has to be stuck in this back end server with no access except from a key few people. So, you know, but just breaking it down by organization, by department is a great start on figuring out how you're going to do data classification. Adopting a patch management program. You know, we've seen Heartbleed, Shellshock, all these different um, vulnerabilities hit um, and exploits within the last few years. And it really comes down to patch management because not a lot of people are patching on a regular basis or they're not being proactive about their patching. Um, and I've been there as well where, you know, you're, you're so busy doing the day-to-day -day tasks but not day-to-day -day fires as an IT team that you don't have time to, you know, be proactive about finding out what's a new vulnerability or skimming the underground, finding out what new exploits are coming out and what they're trying to exploit. You know, it's, you wait until patch Tuesday, you get your list from the vendor, you go ahead and patch those systems after you test them, and boom, you roll it out. But we really need to get more proactive. Like there's, patch, there's places I'm gonna show you like Full Disclosure, Exploit TB. These are websites where people will go ahead and put vulnerabilities that maybe have not yet received a CVE. And a CVE means there's an official reporting of this vulnerability and it has been verified by the vendor. Sometimes it takes the vendors to take a while to verify things. So that's when um, you really look at um, being proactive about it and going to these websites and looking for the vulnerabilities that affect your, or your infrastructure. You don't have to look at everything. Just determine what infrastructure do you have and what vulnerabilities are out there that affect my infrastructure. Everything else, I'm, I'm not going to worry about. I just need to know what affects my environment. So having a solid patch management pro uh, program and being a little proactive about that is fantastic. And of course, staying informed, right? Staying informed of the latest vulnerabilities. As I mentioned, here's some great websites. Exploit TV, Full Disclosure, fantastic websites for you to go to just to be just be aware, you know, these guys follow about 6,000 of the top security bloggers around the world. And, um, you know, just just know what's happening in your industry. Type in healthcare or financial, find out what's happening overseas. Because a lot of times um, attackers will test their code overseas before they bring it in here and try to attack your environment. So it, 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 sometimes it's good to look at Europe. Like we see things like, um, like Configure and Zeus, right? These are credential stealing uh, malware. And they've been modified so many times, they keep remodifying the code to be able to bypass like antivirus controls and things like that. So there's always new variants coming out all the time, but these guys need to test those variants to see if they work. Not only within their own labs, but they need to test it on a production environment, a real environment, to make sure that it actually will work and penetrate as expected. And so they'll run it in their backyard because they can't run it across overseas because of the latency and the timeline of the, the connections that go, uh, that connect all the continents together. They can't wait for that. So they test in their backyard, which is usually uh, Western Europe, like England, Ireland, France, um, Amsterdam, things like that. And so we find that a lot of malware gets hit there. And then once they found some success there, they go through South, uh, Central and South America, where they basically make the code even better. They find different security controls, different security processes, and they start trying to figure out how to circumvent those. 
And then as they fine tune their code, they move here into the US, execute it for the, you know, the major payday because they've been getting paid all the way along, but then they come here for the major payday and then they go off to Asia to go get additional paydays from here. Once we've built um, uh, detection and we've built, um, you know, security content to be able to detect that type of variant. But like, for example, like right now in uh, Asia, right, they're dealing with Invicta and Zeus. They've been dealing with it for like the last couple of years, really hardcore, where, you know, you know, we saw 2007, 2008, 2009, 10, and then it kind of faded and got trampled by other things. So, I mean, it's gonna, it's just getting there. So, but if you see that flow, you understand that we can learn lessons by looking at that global analysis and that might prevent you from being the next victim. So, um, exploit DB, full disclosure, like I said, you know, great websites, the CVs, NIST, and then there's weekly threat reports. We have one, but a lot of security vendors out there have them as well, right? You know, so, you know, I, I'm a big believer of reading as much as you can and being as informed as possible of what might affect my industry, because maybe you might see a competitor or you might see, you know, a partner that might have gotten hit. And you want to think, how would that affect me? Or could I be the next victim? And should I learn some lessons from these so that I can put some um, security in place and defend myself whenever they get around to attacking my infrastructure? So for that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, follow our research. Here's some of our blogs, newsletters. Uh, we have a cloud security report that we do every year that's going to be coming out uh, next month. Um, but of course, to the websites to the right, you know, you want to stay informed, you know, and that's, uh, I hate to steal a line from G.I. Joe, but, you know, knowing is half the battle, right? We got to stay informed of the vulnerabilities that exist out there. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you, and I will uh, hand it back and also open up for questions. If anyone has any questions at this time, you can post them in the chat panel. Um, and then I can always unmute you if you'd like to be able to ask it. Um, in person as well. And if not, um, we will wrap up the webinar. Let's give everyone a minute here. All right, it doesn't look like we have any questions coming in today on the webinar. So on behalf of all of our presenters today, we thank you for joining us and taking the time to view this presentation. Um, the recording of today's webinar will be available within the next two business days and emailed to you as well as hosted on the registration landing page and the CORE YouTube channel. Um, we will also be PDFing the slides and supplying those to the CORE account managers, um, and so you can work with your account manager to receive those. If you have further questions about the webinar, um, about CORE or AlertLogic, please feel free to reach out to the CORE marketing team at marketing.team at corebts.com. Feel free to check out our calendar for other upcoming events, and thank you for your time today.